Hey, welcome back to the Azure Enabling Show with the Armchair Architects. So maybe you've heard the term concentration risk. If you haven't, you should definitely watch this. So join us. Hey, so we're back with Uli and we're at Eric. And today we're going to talk about something that I have to admit sounds kind of abstract to me. Um, we were going to talk a little bit about concentration risk, um, which I could try to define, but I think it would be far better to hear with like, um, I don't know, let's start with you, Eric. Eric, what's concentration risk and, and, and what are we going to talk about? Sure. So um, I spend lots of times with my friends in the financial services industry. So typically, concentration risk is a term that our friends in financial services use to describe an over-indexing or over-investment uh, in a specific area to the harm of the larger portfolio. Uh -huh. And I think the term concentration risk is gaining traction in the technology space, specifically the architecture space, because the same dangers of, of uh, safeguarding your investment also exist in when you're talking about distributed systems and microservice architectures. If the, the, the story goes, if you concentrate in one industry or one vertical or one area, you risk the stability and diversity of your portfolio to withstand any challenges associated with other areas uh, that you're super uh, invested in. The same thing happens when you're looking at architecture. If your architecture is, has transaction processing, it has uh, analytics associated with it, it has a user experience, and there's a key element of technical risk associated with that architecture, your first instinct is to make sure that the system does what it's supposed to do by addressing that element of technical risk. Uh, and sometimes if you're not, if you're not careful, you can be sub find yourself being subjected to concentration risk by over indexing and solving that technical challenge. And then just hoping slash trusting that the rest of the system will kind of develop around that core area of technical risk. And that when you put it into production, things typically don't go that well. So that, that's what happens when you find yourself a, a subject to concentration risk and you say, oh, I over-indexed on asynchronous transaction processing to the detriment of streaming analytics or an inventory reservations or anything like, of that nature. Okay, so Uli, the question I'm gonna ask you is, um, it would be really swell to tell before you did it um, and found yourself staring down the barrel of a system that's not working. Um, is there a way to detect whether you are too, uh, I don't want to use the word myopic, but too, fo too, too monoculture, but myopic isn't a terrible word here, but too, too monoculture in your thinking, if that's a, if that's a thing to say, um, how can you <clears> tell? <throat> and, uh, you know, what do you do, do about it besides, I don't know, um, run around your office going that, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the sky is going to fall help. Yeah. So the way, let me go and bring a historical example again. Uh, I'm the old man around here, so I can do that. Um, and so my view is when you think about the world's dependence on relational databases and SQL, uh, we started in the late 80s. Uh, in the 90s, it started to become really the default. And then in the 2000s, there was just no question. You built it on a relational database because it was great, transactional, ACID, backup restore was easy, um, and stuff like that. But it worked really well for the scope of computing solutions we were trying to solve. But ultimately, it became a concentration risk because there were new requirements coming in that effectively the SQL, the relational databases were ill-equipped to handle, which, mm -hmm. for example, the rise of e-commerce. When you have zero idea <clears throat> how to scale your system, you need elasticity, you need to be able to scale beyond a single node and so forth. And for the most part, relational databases effectively are still bound to a single computer because right. there's lots of reasons why that is. Right. Um, and that's, for example, the rise of NoSQL. <clears throat> so from my perspective, the detection primarily is that you can't meet the requirements that you're supposed to meet with the technologies that you have been focusing on because you have talent, you have training, you have experience, the operational model is clear. All of these are good things. But then all of a sudden you see, oh, now I need to really uh, do lots of arm twisting and lots of crazy things to make that technology work for my scenario. Again, relational to NoSQL is a really good example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And then you effectively go, you know, in, you are in a concentration risk area where you say, oh, I've concentrated too much on one pattern, the relational asset, all this stuff, which doesn't meet my requirements now in e-commerce, for example, where you have lots of unknowns, unknown scale, uh, unknown transaction rate, where you just can't design the system. Or if you design it, you over provision. It's a ginormous system. And then you have this many transactions. Oopsie. So you spend a lot of time, money, and effectively go do that. And so that's where I think uh, concentration risks happen. And then, funnily enough, the world shifted also to NoSQL is the answer for everything, which is right. also nonsense because relational databases have a lot of great attributes that make a lot of sense and make development of applications really easy. For example, asset transactions are fantastic. You can write into the database, you hold the transaction, and some other people can try and write the, read the data. The database will effectively protect you from ghost data and stuff like that. If you don't have asset, like in NoSQL databases, you have to figure out, is this data right, is, is this data written already or not, or what's going on? So there's a lot of good things about NoSQL. There's good things about uh, relational, and you have to understand which is what. And concentration risk is if you over, over pivot to one or the other technology and or pattern uh, to effectively solve your problems. At least from my perspective, uh, that's a good interpretation of uh, the explanation that Eric gave or the definition. I'm getting the sense, Eric, that it's both a combination of dependencies on a single thing, which is a little bit where you were going early with that, and also, um, uh, sort of the economy of, of attention, like where are you, what are you, in addition to what are you depending on, it's also what are you paying attention to? Um, yep. And, uh, and it would seem to me, based on what Uli was saying, that, you know, humans are really good at sticking with the things that they really know and they really, you know, they, 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 they have a lot of expertise with and and so I don't think that I, I think this would be it seems pretty natural to me so my, my guess my question for you is um, I, I don't think what you're suggesting as a way around this is um, do we uh, you're not suge you're not suggesting that okay like you realize that you're paying attention to just a single thing so you're gonna go just go find another wacky thing to go look at to sort of like to like take a break right right like oh you know I'm so interested in this how about uh, blockchain I think I'll pay attention to blockchain right now in the middle, you know, in the middle of my, in the middle of my thing. And so I don't think you're suggesting like take a vacation from, no. from the technologies you're using, but what, but what do you, what, what's, how do you ameliorate this? I guess is the place so, I'm going. So I, I really like your phrase economy of attention because that's really what it is. It's being able to spend your attention in different places and it's easy for you to over index. Like you said, we all gravitate towards what we are comfortable with and what right. we've grown up on and what we feel confident with, which is why, you know, newer, newer, early in career folks think NoSQL is the answer for everything because they're more comfortable with it than old uh, crusty guys like me and Uli who you grew up during the relational era. So here, here's what I think, you know, to kind of bring this home, this is what my thought process is, is here. Um, avoid silly miracles. I call them silly miracles because they're unnatural human tricks associated with you trying to fix concentration risk uh, that you've already experienced by doing, doing things that are miraculously uh, kind of silly to cover up a hole uh, in a portion of an architecture or portion of a solution that didn't uh, do what it's supposed to because you focus too much in one area. Example, please, just before we go farther, because I like the term, I just, I just need an example to, to drive that home. Sure. What's, a, so what's an example of a silly miracle? A silly miracle is one in which you focus on flushing transactions to the database in your order taking application, but you don't do a good job of taking the orders themselves or scaling to take the order. So the order taking experience suffers because you focus so wholeheartedly and making sure you can flush those transactions to the database with intentional consistency that you have a really good database write engine, but you have a really bad order taking experience. So a silly miracle would be, well, holy moly, now I actually have to write a whole bunch of hard coded uh, you know, code in order to make sure that the that the front end of the application actually con constitutes a good experience for customers, which, by the way, will generate technical debt, which makes your system kind of untenable from a maintenance perspective. So to avoid those silly miracles, the question becomes, well, do I want to detect when I'm in it? And the answer is yes, you want you certainly want to think about it from a from a concentration risk perspective. 
So my idea and the way I keep track of this is, is I audit the concept counts associated with the entire system. And I think we had an episode where we talked about concept yeah, yeah, counts. Yeah, 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 totally. So if you have addressable concept counts, one way to figure out if you're over-indexing is how much time have I spent looking at all these other concepts that the system has to do in service of the end-to-end, -end, in service of the experience and what this thing is really here to do. It might be fun to create a really scalable database flush uh, or transactional system that flushes to the database, but is that going to denigrate or um, be detrimental to the whole purpose that the system is here to serve, which is taking orders? Which is which is not which is not intentional, right? It's it's no. not the it's not the case that you're like, oh, I'm going to spend all my time on this. This is a cool thing. Um, the heck with the rest of the stuff. It's more just like we are humans. There's a zero sum game on our on our our time and our attention. I mean, presumably without an infinite project length, right? So right. so taking it back to the, the 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 origins of this concept, concentration risk in financial services. Uh -huh. If you're over index or if you're over invested in a specific industry a specific stock that should make you feel comfortable you might feel good while the stock is going up but then when the entire industry takes a hit and goes down then you're like okay i i you know my, all of my all of my funding was in this bucket and now it's it's trash so think about it the same it's the same <clears throat> concept yeah it's yeah, kind of again, like it's kind of oh i'm sorry go ahead Oli. Was... no so sorry david um again the way i think about this is keep an open mind and have a tools chain of capabilities that you're looking at from the technology, relational NoSQL and so forth, the patterns and the approaches, and always step back and saying, what's the most rational course we can take? Um, and if you don't, if you feel like I'm going down my usual rat hole because that's I really understand, maybe reach out to some other friends and saying, hey, I'm looking at this problem. Do I look at this the right way? So that's mm -hmm. another way to really work around uh, mm -hmm. concentration risk because you only know what you know. Um, and if you are able to reach out to a community of people, either internally or externally, to say, here's what I'm trying to solve. It's a great point. Uh, what do you guys think? I think you get a much more diverse perspective. Again, you should temper this with what is my organization capable, what can we operate, and so forth. So I, I don't go for esoteric stuff that is maybe the right thing to do for the solution without looking at the other half of the problem. Can I implement it? Can I operate it? Uh, do I have the money to buy whatever I need to buy and stuff like that? So I think there's a little bit of a balance, uh, but it's really important to not over-index on specific things. Uh, to the point where you just say that's automatically the answer to the question. Again, I always love this when people do this, uh, something new comes up. Right now, the metaverse is the term. Uh, everything is a metaverse. Okay, uh, it doesn't still doesn't solve uh, relational or transactional database problems. Uh, so we still need all that stuff. And so from that perspective, uh, avoid the hipster terms, um, not at all costs, but use the hipster terms for things that make sense. Uh, but still have the arsenal of technology in your mind um, to solve real business problems. So I think the metaverse would make for an excellent technique for ending this episode. Is it going to happen? I think we need to do an episode. No, 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 no. I mean, I meant, I'm sorry. I, meant, I, meant, I think the metaverse is going to work as a way of, of taking us out because it's a nice way to just call the conversation to a, an end and we can just all stare into the distance longingly for that time. Um, and with that, with that little snarky comment, I want to thank you, Uli, and I want to thank you, Eric, and I want to thank everybody for watching this. Thanks so much, and I hope you'll join us in another episode of the Azure Enablement Show. Mm -hmm.